Good evening and welcome to our very first webinar of 2021. I'm Jamie Stout, the Director of Membership for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation. I want to start off by saying thank you to each and every one of you for making this past year possible. It's our members who are really the backbone of our organization. You are the ones who stood behind us, weathered the pandemic, and continue to give in really big ways to ensure that our mission of keeping Mr. Lincoln's legacy alive possible. Over 3,000 of you have tuned in since May to these webinars since we hosted our first webinar. Um, this has far exceeded our expectations, and we really look forward to offering more educational sessions throughout 2021. Another great highlight that we have of 2021 is the foundation has a new president and CEO as of Monday. So that's super exciting. Um, so let me introduce to you Aaron Carlson Mast. Aaron was the CEO and executive director of the President Lincoln's Cottage in Washington, DC prior to joining us. Um, she brings a very distinguished track record of museums and fundraising and research and exhibits and programming and a lot more. So we're super honored to have her talents here at the foundation and we couldn't be more happy about it. So please help me welcome Erin. Thank you, Jamie. It's my pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. Um, in my first week, I'm, I'm crashing this party a little bit um, because I've known uh, Pete for a long time and so um, I thought that this was a great thing to do in my first week here to get to um, do something with all of you, our members. And um, I just wanna let you know how excited I am for all that the future has to hold for our organization and for the field of Lincoln and Civil War studies in general. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Carmichael. He's the Fleur Professor of History and the Director of Civil War, the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College. After completing his doctorate at Penn State University, Professor Carmichael went on to teach at Western Carolina University, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and West Virginia University. With some time at President Lincoln's Cottage in that mix. <laughs> right. He's the author and editor of four uh, books and has also published a number of articles for both scholarly and popular journals. Um, and most Junes, uh, he directs the Civil War Institute Summer Conference, which typically draws more than 300 attendees from across the country. I've had the great pleasure of knowing Pete since 2004, and I'm proud to be able to call him a dear friend. Please join, and now I'm gonna turn it over actually to Dr. Christian McWhorter first to get us started. Thank yeah. you all so much. Great. Aaron, thank you so much. This is very, very kind. Christian, before you take over, I'm gonna now intercede and say that uh, you all have uh, an absolutely terrific person, just a, an amazing director who did fantastic work at the Lincoln Cottage. I, I be honest, I'm sad to see Aaron leave having the uh, Lincoln Cottage just down the road in Washington, DC. It is a terrific place to take my students because what Aaron was able to accomplish there, not many historical sites have done. She was able to make the past usable. Uh, she's able to engage contemporary issues related to democracy in the country and around the world. And she used that place as really as more than a museum, but as a laboratory uh, for people of all ages. And so uh, her legacy there will last. It is absolutely an important one. And uh, I'm excited to see what Erin's gonna be able to accomplish here in her, her new position. So again, um, congratulations, Erin. And uh, very excited to see what's coming down the road uh, for her and for your organization. And so now, Christian. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, no, it's fine. I'll keep the love fest going. I uh, I'm very excited about Aaron as well. I only uh, uh, I've met Aaron a couple times. Um, we're both on the the board of the Lincoln Forum together. But I, the, I really this is the first time I've I've really you know gotten to interact with her um, was this week uh, when she started. And so I'm I'm really excited about um, working with Aaron and uh, gave her a little tour of the museum yesterday. Uh, she'd been there before, but you know we gave her a bit of a behind the scenes deal. So I'm also um, really excited about the future here and looking forward to working with her. Um, I also uh, want to give a little praise to, to Pete as well before we start. Pete, uh, I've known uh, Peter Carmichael for, for a few years now. And um, I, I wanted before we started Pete to say what a, what a thrill it was to have you on here when I, I 
started doing this regular program in the summer, which I'm, I'm happy to say the members that we're going to continue through this year, I think, doing this. Um, you're one of the first people on my list, Pete, I wanted to call um, because I knew you, you know, you'd be really great for this kind of conversation. Um, but, you know, you've also been a real supporter of me throughout my career. Pete, uh, Pete edited my book. Pete uh, has always been really encouraging of me um in what i've done and one of the things i like about pete and i hope we can talk about today we're most you know we're going to start by focusing on pete's work and his history work but i want to talk about uh public history with pete too because pete is is uh I, I scholars who straddle that academic and public history line um you know are my kind of people and so uh and pete does a wonderful job with that so i definitely want to talk oh, pete has a fascinating history uh, of working on public history, as well as, you know, Aaron listed the various places Pete has taught, but Pete's also worked at a lot of historic well, sites. Along Kristen, the Kristen, she slipped in there. Did you, did you, did you catch that? <laughs> she said, and the Lincoln Cottage. I yes. do have the distinction of being the very first director of the Lincoln right. Cottage. Um, I discovered that I missed the classroom a great deal and missed being a scholar. And right. so I stayed there for less than a year. But while I was there, Erin was there. So we got an opportunity to work together. And she promised me, and I will see if it came through, that she was going to put a plaque, uh, my name on it, as the first director of the Lincoln Cottage. So, uh, <laughs> so yes, you're right. I have done a lot of things in the field of public history. My advisor, Gary Gallagher, I know many in the audience know him, know his work. Uh, when I studying under, under Dr. Gallagher, he said to me that if I ever stopped talking to the public, that he would disown me. <laughs> You're serious about that. And, uh, and I'm glad he said that to me. Now, there was never any threat that that would happen. But uh, I was very fortunate uh, to have a lot of great mentors. I had mentors such as Dr. Gallagher. I also had a number of mentors in the National Park Service where I worked every summer. Uh, starting in, man, I am old. When I say something like this, I'm like, God, I can't believe how old I am. 1985, 1985, I was Corporal Billy Fields at Appomattox Courthouse, nine to five every day in a wool union uniform, pretending that it was 1865. They did first person interpretation. And uh, it was quite an experience. It was quite an experience because although I'm from Indiana, I was a little bit of a lost causer back then. And uh, I remember having to betray a Union soldier, getting called a damn Yankee day in and day out. Yeah, it's kind of in jest, but after a while, it was a little more than an annoyance. And just having people say time and time again that, you know, Ulysses S. Grant was nothing but a drunk. He never really won anything. And clearly I'm not the brightest person in the room because it took a while. And finally I said, what in God's name is going on here? Like the man that won the war, and this is you know, the beginning of the process of reunion and carrying on the struggle of emancipation. Why is it that he is diminished uh, routinely and by most visitors? And it was at a time, it's important to note, that there was really an official message that came from Appomattox. That official message was to tell visitors that that place was the place where the country came back together. Yeah. Now, we know that certainly it was a significant step in that direction. But we were not to, to emphasize or to distress anything about the war continuing in another guise as it did uh, during Reconstruction. We said nothing about emancipation, zero. Yeah. Now, here's the good news here, and then Christian, I'll turn it over so you can ask the question. I have a number of students who have worked at Appomattox. In fact, one of my former students at West Virginia University, uh, she's chief of interpretation there. Um, she and my students, they talk about emancipation. They talk about the experience of African-Americans have been doing it for some time. And so for those people who say, you know what, the field of history has not really changed in terms no. of the topics, the people that are discussed, that's just not true. It's not true. And I, there has been a sea change in the last, I'd say 10 to 15 years. And one of those changes is right at Appomattox. And you can only imagine how gratifying it is you know, my students out there talking about the struggle of emancipation, mm -hmm. uh, telling people that the war did not end in the parlor of the McLean house, that it continued. I mean, that is, uh, that's some good stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm never going to, uh, to publish a book that's going to get a Pulitzer or maybe even get any kind of award at all. I don't really care about any of that. But I do know this, the most important thing that we can do as scholars is, uh, 
reach out to these young people who, who do have a hunger for the past and a real desire to go out there and to do exactly what Christian is doing, to do what Aaron has done. So, you know, don't succumb to the cynicism about young people out there. It's just not true at all. So I, you didn't even get your first question in here. No, it's okay. And I, I really do want to talk about historic sites later. And, and I want to uh, reiterate what Jamie said, by the way, too, uh, that everybody out there, please feed us your questions. We're going to talk a little about Pete's book, but also, yeah, please give us questions about public history and stuff like that. Cause Pete and I are both very interested in that. And, uh, and I want to put a button on what you said about, about young people too. You know, it's one of my real um, pleasures since I've been in the orbit of the Presidential Library Museum now for about 10 years, and I've worked with a lot of interns and students and seeing them, I've been here long enough too. I feel old too, that like I'm, I'm seeing them get out in the world now. A lot of them, uh, two of them were actually work at the library now, two of my former interns, you know, sure. where I see them get jobs other places. And it's the most rewarding thing in the world <laughs> to yeah. see these young people that you've worked with and then see them make contributions. And it's just, it's, it, it, never gets old right i just love never, it, so, it yeah. absolutely it never ever gets old it's very exciting well let's let's talk a little about civil war soldiers though sure. pete's oh. most recent book um is the war for the common soldier um and um it's a really uh it's a really fascinating book um which uh i read uh i guess what a year ago now uh and um but the, uh, you know, let's just give people an overview. Some of you out there are probably already familiar that there is a long, it's one of the longest kind of historiographical subjects in the field, is these books about soldiers and what motivated them, right? Going back to Bell Irvin Wiley, some of you have uh, probably read, you know, uh, James McPherson's For Cause and Comrades. Um, what Pete does with this book um, is is really, I think, Pete, you try to do something really original here, where you the, the way you approach the topic, and then you know, obviously, some of the conclusions you come to. So, can you just give us maybe a quick overview of, yeah, of where yeah. this book fits with the stuff that came before it, and, and what you really tried to accomplish uh, here? Well, well, Christian is correct, and there is a very rich historiography or or literature on the common soldier. And when I started this project, the editors. Um, the task they gave me was to bring all of that secondary literature or historiography, bring that together, and then to also then make an original contribution. That's a very difficult assignment. You're really asking the author to do two very different things. And it became apparent to me that the historiography was fully developed, and it's fully developed around the question of motivation. Why did soldiers fight? And Christian mentioned James McPherson's work for Cause and Comrades, his smaller, slimmer volume. And if you've not read it, I'll say it slowly so you can write it down. Uh, what they fought for. I, I assign that to my students. It is uh, accessible. Uh, it draws heavily from the letters of soldiers. It's, of course, gracefully written because James McPherson did it. Uh, those are two books that stand out in people's mind when they think about the common soldier. But again, there are so many other people that actually preceded McPherson. Uh, Joe Glattar is one, Earl Hess, Gerald Linderman, and the list goes on. So here's the bottom line. I reached a point where I didn't know what I was going to do because I didn't think I could say anything new about motivation, and I still believe that. And I don't think there's much room to maneuver there. But what I needed to do is to reinvent myself as a historian. And so I became more of a cultural historian. Um, and becoming a cultural historian, I will say that quite simply, my task became to get into the interior world of these men. Uh, that's something that leaves me a little uneasy because I know that one has to, at times, distance oneself from the source itself. But I didn't want to just read the source as, okay, why did these men fight? Well, they're basically saying the same thing, man. Your note cards that just pile over your head after a while because they're making basically the same statements. So I had to think about not what they thought, but how they thought. And it is that question, how they thought, that I believe gave me an angle into the lives of these men that we've not really seen before. And then the second element of this is that I also decided to do case studies or microbiography. So the book is not a smattering of quotes from all over the place. Instead, you follow the lives of a handful of individuals and it enabled me to give a deep contextual read to their lives. And what we see as a result 
is that in much of the literature on the common soldier, why did men fight? We get a little quote here from one letter, maybe another excerpt from a diary, and that's valuable and that's important. But what it misses is that there is a fluidity of ideas and action that takes place over time. And we'll talk about some more about some other men. In fact, one who didn't even surface in my book, it's an Illinois soldier whose letters were uh, published just a few years ago. The book is called Infernal War. It's one of my favorites. God, I wished it was out when I was researching my book. But Infernal War and, and some of these other soldiers will find that if you take a snapshot approach to their letters, you can find a soldier who, after the Battle of Gettysburg, if he's in the Army of the Potomac, can express great patriotism and love for the country and a hopefulness that the war is going to come to a conclusion. But if you just take that snapshot and you don't look at the entirety of that man's career, you won't see that in the summer of 1864 that there were new challenges. The challenges not just practical and physical of surviving in the ranks, but there were intellectual challenges as well. And so my goal in this book was to give to the reader the totality of that man's experience. I want you to feel like you're standing in the shoes of that soldier. I want you to be able to feel the war. I want you to be able to smell the war. And I want you to also understand that the words they wrote, they often seem to us to be expressions that are clear cut, transparent, and insertions of duty and patriotism. And yes, there were those moments, but there were also just as many moments when these men were confused, their thinking was muddled. That's where I wanna get the reader, right? That's the good stuff because that's the stuff that defines what day-to-day -day life was like struggling in the ranks. And if you look at the dust jacket cover, uh, you will see, in fact, you should just show the picture here, a before and after picture. You, you'll see that there was a time that I uh, took better care of my hair. It's a long story, it's part pandemic as well. And I think it's also, uh, maybe a little bit of a, it's a midlife crisis, but also maybe also a late childhood rebellion against my mother, who is just absolutely appalled at my hair right now. But uh, unfortunately, I, my my hair hair stylist, I should note, um, yeah, she's a little bit difficult to get to these days during the time of pandemic. So uh, <laughs> I usually don't look quite this shaggy. So we're, get, we're getting soldier motivation. We're also getting Pete's hair motivation. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, why to give people the money's worth here, right? Yeah, Pete mentioned um, this Infernal War. I know some of you who watch these are, are people who spend time at the museum and, and who come to our programming there. Yeah, that's it. It was It's edited by um, Timothy Roberts, yeah. who teaches at Western Illinois. And he came and gave a talk. Um, some of you might have been there a couple years ago um, about that book. And, and, and the people in it are very... Um, What's interesting about that book uh, uh, is how um, of how I mean they're really they're copperheads they're they're so anti Lincoln I mean they're just vicious uh, about Lincoln um, you know so let's uh, I do want to get to um, the psychology of the soldiers that we talked about but since you raised the book and yeah. since we're the Lincoln Library um, yeah. you know yeah. what where is this because you know that's one of the really interesting things about your book is is the experience of the war you know like you said there's this politics and they're thinking about this politics and that's what McPherson and others are writing about but the experience of the war itself is doing something different to them right so can you talk a little bit about how those two things interact yeah yes and so again this book I'm sorry the glare is so awful here but the the, the infernal war I, I, I can't I, I can't say enough good things about this book, in large part because there's two way correspondence between William Standard and his wife, Jane. Yeah. And Jane, she, she's a little rough around the edges. Her yeah, language is yeah. very, very vulgar in places. They both use the N word all the time. I, I remember in one letter she wrote to her husband that she had been searching in the area uh, to try to find a school for her kids. And to quote her, I can remember this. She said, there's not a school worth a shit around here. <laughs> so, so for entertainment value, it's, it's pretty good. But as Christian pointed out, yeah, both of them are, uh, are copperheads. Now she actually came from a Republican family, but she changed her tune pretty quickly. And he, 
I joined the war in 1862. He was in his 40s and he was having some very serious financial issues. So I think in part he was some, escaping some creditors and hoping, of course, to make a little bit money on the side. But what again is important, and of course, it, I think it reaffirms my approach to how we should study the common soldier, is that we see at the beginning, both of them uh, have, uh, or I should say, lodged diatribes against Lincoln. They see that this is a war for African Americans. Again, they use the N word repeatedly. But then once Standard gets into the ranks and once he gets into Mississippi, he never became a fan of Lincoln, but he came to see that the sacrifices that were being made in the field and the need to try to bring this war to a conclusion meant that supporting the Republican administration would ultimately be in his best interest. And so what you find with Standard and what I found time and time again with men on both sides is a pragmatism. And that pragmatism, again, I think is a key contribution of my book because what the pragmatism concept allows us to understand is that as important as these ideas were, we found it in James Pearson's book yeah, for Cause and Comrade. They mattered. I'm not denying that. But these ideas did not drive and did not push these men to behave and act in mechanical ways. To survive in the field, you had to be a man who thought with flexibility. You had to act according to circumstances, not according to dogma and out of principle. So the flexibility that these men showed in a wide variety of ways, we see in William Standard a flexibility in his political thoughts. And Election of 1864, Abraham Lincoln. You might be surprised to know that Standard ultimately did what? He cast his lot with Lincoln. He did it reluctantly, but it, what was his primary objective? It was to get out of the war and to get out of the war whole and to bring this rebellion to a conclusion. And you know, there's some very good work. Jonathan White did a book on the presidential election of 1864. I think he is absolutely right that those Democrats who voted for Abraham Lincoln, that this was no switch to another party. This was a vote, I think they probably held their nose and they did it. And they did it because again, they thought that that was the straightest route to be able to get to the conclusion of this conflict. So that pragmatism again is better than talking about the soldiers as what was their loyalty? What was their state of morale? None of this stuff's fixed, it's fluid, right? And once we can really stand in their shoes and see how this thing unravels, and I wanna stress again, you gotta go from all angles, right? The smell, the touch, all that for, for standard and I'll leave standard alone here. For standard, he saw in the uniform, the clothes itself, the wool. He read into that as a symbol of his oppression in the ranks because he saw in this uniform, having to wear it, of course, in Mississippi, where it was just dreadfully hot and disease was just on a rampage through his camp, that he came to associate the clothing and the uniform as the betrayal and the abandonment of the Union soldier that the military had basically just taken them just cast them aside to die in these swamp lands the uniform mattered the smells of the hospital man it, that stench he wrote about it right again it was a sense of what has happened to us right, as soldiers who were supposed to go off into this war and that this war was supposed to uplift men right make them stronger physically as well as morally that's all just the opposite of it all so uh that standard book fantastic and I just want to say again, in reading these letters, I'm one of these individuals that I, um, I don't take, derive much satisfaction or purpose in wagging my finger at people in the past. Mm -hmm. They are of a different time of us, and I understand that their assumptions and their belief system is radically different. And so with the standards, you know, their letters are pretty hard to read in places. But there is something beautiful in their relationship. They were deeply in love with each other. And of course, with William in the ranks, their household was under financial duress. She had to take on borders. She had to take on other odd jobs. And at the very end of the war, he sent her a letter from Louisville. 
And again, they're very frank and very descriptive. I remember he, he wrote about Louisville, about all the brothels. He said there were brothels all over the place. And, <laughs> and then he said to her, did he expect her to come home soon? That he wanted to be sure that when he saw her for the first time, that she would find a place, a place that would be somewhat secluded, away from the eye of other family members or friends, that he wanted to have that moment of reunion with her so that they could express their feelings and their emotions freely. It's touching, right? It's touching. Yeah, he was a racist dog and so was his wife. But you know what? A lot of other people were as well. And, and I want to understand those racial ideas. I want to understand how he was able, again, to fight this fight for union and still hold true to them. I should note that she didn't shed a single tear when she learned that Lincoln had been killed. She noted that there were, I believe, uh, church bells that were ringing yeah. to mark the mourning uh, of, uh, or the loss of the president. And she basically said, you know, good riddance. I'm glad the man's gone. I'm glad the man's gone. Well, and I, and I want to, you know, you're talking a lot, like there's an emphasis here on, in your book that I really appreciate on emotion. You know, one of the, um, and again, I keep getting close to the public history stuff here. One of the, the pet peeves I have in the public perception of the Civil War is these soldiers really get sanitized a lot. And, you know, especially in popular depictions, but even in the literature, um, and like you, I think a lot of James McPherson's works, so I don't want anyone to misinterpret that I'm slamming those, those books because I think they're wonderful, but there's you know if you if you look mostly at motivation it, it sanitizes the experience both the highs and the lows of the experience and you know i always try to emphasize when i talk about civil war soldiers just what a horrifying experience it was to be a civil war soldier like it was right. no fun at all right. and you know that the one of the things i appreciated about your book is the emphasis what you say with the flexibility you know that that's that emphasis is is you know that that comes from the horror <laughs> uh, that they're you know they're dealing with horror and their primary motivation in, in a lot of situations again this seems elementary but i don't think it gets into the books enough their primary motivation in a lot of scenarios is just surviving right and so you're gonna everything else in, is gonna um situate itself around that goal at certain right. points right? right that's right absolutely and i think that the one thing about the emotional reaction to combat which is a, a topic that I know that many of the people watching here that we're fascinated by, you know, we've, we've been to these historic sites and you can stand on Cemetery Ridge and, or excuse me, on Seminary Ridge and you look across those fields of Longstreet's assault and you think, how did these men do it? And then how did those survivors come to terms with it? And I think that the very best way of explaining or understanding that is if you have to make a generalization is to say that the men were deeply conflicted by what they had seen and by what they had done on the battlefield. They certainly were horrified. They certainly could be emotionally devastated by it. And yet they did gain some sort of exhilaration uh, from it. And, and also they found in combat that it was a way to assert themselves as men. And quickly to give you an example, uh, the letters of Charles Biddlecom, uh, no freedom, Shrieker, no freedom shrieker. Charles Biddlecom. Charles Biddlecom came into the Army of the Potomac in 1864, that fall, excuse me, in the fall of 1863. He came in the fall of 1863. He hated everything about the Army, detested it, detested his officers. He uh, was very sick, but the surgeons would not give him a medical discharge because he had taken a bounty. So they kept him in the ranks. He had some comrades who tried to induce him to desert. He almost did it. He did not. He stayed with his outfit, the 147th New York. They were in the thick of things during the Overland campaign. He came out on the other side. He was shaken badly by it. He noticed that many of his surviving comrades, that their bodies and spirits started to break down. But through that ordeal, passing through that fire, he found his sense of being a man and that he had earned a reputation of being a man. That's outside of politics, of course. And he knew that that reputation was something that nobody could ever take away from him. And yet he was still devastated emotionally by what he had seen. And I'll end with this quick anecdote that goes back to things because they do matter. And the thing 
is his uniform. And he looked at his uniform after the Overland campaign and he told his wife that he wanted to send it home and he wanted her to stuff it and put it in his office. And he said that if he ever had a bad day on the farm, that all he had to do was to look at his stuffed uniform. And he knew that the worst day on the farm right, was <laughs> still better than the best day in the army. Right. Right? Now, a few weeks later, his jacket, it's replaced, it's a new one. He wrote his wife. He said that his old sack coat, that there was not an item of clothing that he treasured more. He said, because that clothing, that sack coat, it had the soil stains of the wilderness, Spotsylvania, North Anna, and of course it had the blood of, of his comrades. Right there in that thing, you can get a sense of how these men, again, they were badly conflicted um, by what they had gone through. And I'll just quickly also add here, Christian, you make a very good point that these soldiers were much more expressive than what I had imagined. Mm -hmm. More expressive about their emotions to their wives and not just missing their wives, but more expressive with their fellow comrades. And we all know that comradeship mattered a great deal, but there is a, and I might have this picture right here. For my battlefield tours. So <laughs> this is, this is Henry Owen. Henry Owen to the 18th Virginia Pickett's Charge. They suffered, I think, probably low 70% casualties. That's severe, right? Owen survived. Owen and his regiment make their way down into Virginia, of course, after the battle. They arrive at their old camp at Culpeper, a camp that they had occupied at the start of the Gettysburg campaign. Now, the few letters that he wrote from Gettysburg to Culpeper, they basically just chronicled movements. They didn't reveal but the letter from the old camp at Culpeper is one of the most powerful and the most poignant I've ever seen. He said that he looked around and he said their camp was basically still intact. He could still see where the little shanties had been. He could see the fire pits, except what was missing. What was missing? All the men that had been lost at Gettysburg. He said he saw one comrade who had lost his brother. Not sure if he's killed or captured. He saw this man go wander off into the woods. He said the man was truly despondent. He saw other men breaking down and crying, right? It finally came to them what this great loss of life, uh, what its impact was. Mm -hmm. And so again, you know, I feel very strongly about trying to understand people in the past and trying to understand why people who we often say, you know, they didn't really have a stake in the institution of slavery or the cause that they fought for was a cause that was an immoral one. And one, of course, can make any of those judgments that you want. But I think that what my responsibility is as a historian is to try to understand right, why someone like Henry Owen, why he did what he did, and how he tried to make sense of that. Uh, for me, that's a pretty formidable task and uh, takes all my brain power just to do that. And I'll just sort of, like I said, hold back the moral judgments for somebody else. Well, I want to emphasize, um, you mentioned the case studies earlier. And that's one of the things that I really liked about this book. It makes the book very readable is, is you give us these case studies, these deep dives into to these individual stories. And we, we talked about these conflicting motivations, the, but also these conflicting emotions that they're feeling, all this kind of, you know, because you're able to go deep on these guys, that really um, comes across very effectively. So it was a, um, it's an interesting stylistic choice. It's not one that's normally made um, in a lot of academic books, um, but it, I think it's really effective in this book. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I think, you know, Christian, and we can also talk some more about public history, but, you know, yeah. for those again who are watching, I think we probably all could agree that what led us to our love of the past is always stories. Mm -hmm. But for me, stories in themselves are not sufficient. Mm -hmm. Stories still need to convey an idea. Uh, stories need to try to answer a question or raise new questions. And so I believe not just in writing, but I also believe on historical sites that these are the opportunities where we can tell these stories because they, again, are so captivating. But at the same time, we cannot lose sight of the fact that we have, I think, an obligation to try to figure out the deep meaning of those stories 
And when we're on a historical side, it's not just the event itself. Here at Gettysburg, it's not just July 1st through, through 3, 1863. We have a layered landscape here, a landscape that became a place of commemoration and continues to be one. And how people have come to this place and how they make meaning of the Civil War, the groups that are included, the groups that are excluded, the politics that are debated, all of that matters a great deal. My colleague at the Civil War Institute, Jill Titus. Jill Titus has a manuscript, book manuscript that will be coming out in the fall, 1963, not 1863, 1963. It's a powerful book, it's an important book. And it's a book about the centennial here at Gettysburg. And one of the great pieces of research that she did at the eternal peace light flame. I think I got that right. Yeah. When they dedicated that monument, the person who gave the benediction was an African-American woman. African-American woman who was a pastor, preacher in Gettysburg. And in that benediction, and she obviously made mention of not the war, but also of course the ongoing struggle for black freedom. Who was sitting up on that stage it was none other than Alabama's George Wallace, right? Segregation, what? Segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, I believe, right? There he was, right? There is that moment. And you think about this, folks, when you've gone to Gettysburg, think of all of those important stories, the ones that are told, the ones that aren't told. Why? And I'm not trying to suggest any conspiracy here. That's nonsense. But what I am saying to you is that when you come back to Gettysburg, and I know you will, there's a lot to think about here, a lot to think about, which of course has great relevance with contemporary issues, but we gotta go all the way back, man. Go back to 1913, if you want, right? To the, to the uh, reunion of Civil War veterans there. Uh, the very first one is what, 18, I always get this date off. It's 1887, 1886, when Pickett's men, I believe, come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the point being is this, I, again, when you come to any historical site, just remind yourself of this. And there is a long history at that site of how people are engaging the past. It's important, right? It's important, very revealing. And again, it always reminds us that this story is ongoing. Well, let's talk about that since you're, that's a perfect bridge for to <laughs> to get on these battlefields and historic sure. sites. Um, because yeah, I mean, you're someone who definitely bridges the two kind of worlds. Um, and, you know, let's talk a little about battlefields. You do a lot of battlefield tours, um, mm -hmm. and I'm fascinated by, um, you know, these battlefield sites. It's, it's one of my real gateways to the civil war. I was already interested in the civil war, but you know, when I was an undergrad, I came down with my brother. I'm from Canada for those of you who don't know. And I drove down and, and toured all the Virginia battlefields in Gettysburg and, um, you know, that was really transformative for me being in those places. And they've, um, and like you said, that was really before the kind of interpretive, I mean, almost revolution that took place uh, in the next decade after that, that, that's made them even better. So let, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, about, you know, place and, and, you know, dealing directly with the public in those environments and, and, you know, your, your thoughts on that kind of stuff, how that can yeah, 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 absolutely. Us. So Christian, I, you're referring to about 1995, there was an initiative called Holding the High Ground. And it was uh, an effort within the National Park Service at Civil War sites to do more than just tell visitors where men fought, but to talk to visitors about why they fought there and what of course was the meaning or the impact of these battles. Some important and fundamental questions that parks have been basically skirting. I mean, my point about Appomattox is a good example of the, I would say, very contained interpretation. Now, from that point, parks have taken their own, I would say, course or route, and most, in fact, have fulfilled what I would say is the promise of holding the high ground. Here at Gettysburg, the museum exemplifies that historical aspiration, and I think that they have absolutely achieved it. I think that the Park Service historians look by and large, but listen, people are free to interpret things the way they want, right? And holding a high ground was not any dogma that was imposed on anyone. And so people do do their own interpretation, but I've seen a change amongst uh, employees of, of all grades, uh, all ranks of wanting again to do all they can to contextualize the battlefield. And it of course is really great to see. But let me just give you again how things 
change and sometimes maybe slower than what probably should have happened. And this is not a criticism of the Park Service. I, just, I want a quick aside here. The Park Service folks who are always facing uh, budgets that are yes. uh, just paper thin, right? And, and they do so much with so little. Absolutely. And they have been stewards for our sites and they have done the interpretation, I think for the right way. And there was an initiative by academic historians that I was a part of and I believed in. But my fear was is that it was perceived by many of academics coming in as we typically like to do and start wagging our finger and mm -hmm. saying, you need to do good history. I think that there was an element of that, which was unfortunate, but I went by myself down to the crater at Petersburg. It was a life dream of mine to do interpretation down there. And I did, I had letters that I handed out to people. It was fantastic, which now leads to my transition back to the broadening of interpretation. And just this fall for the first time, my colleague, Jill Titus and I, we did, I don't know how many programs at the Virginia Monument. Now, let me again say, the Park Service people have been doing this stuff. I, I can't stress that enough. They've been mm -hmm. talking about Confederate monuments for a long time. But I took people out and I said to them, all right, there's Cemetery Ridge, there's the Cops of Trees, here's Pickett's Division, here's Pettigrews. We all know what happened. Now turn around, look into the Spangler Woods. And what do you see? Most people say, well, you'd see wounded men. You'd see maybe some stragglers, some cowards possibly. All right, what else would you see? That's probably it. Of course, you'd see hundreds of enslaved men, right? Enslaved men that had accompanied the army. God knows how many, probably anywhere between eight to 10,000, maybe even more, served a wide variety of, of, of roles in Lee's army. There they are, right? And for so long, we have said, you really can't talk about the African-American experience at Gettysburg because they're just not there. No, it's just really not true at all. Yeah. And so I took a letter from a Georgia officer who wrote about his slave, Moses, a slave that he had offered freedom to in Pennsylvania. Of course, Moses did not take it. And as a result, this Georgia officer wrote back to his family, boasted about Moses's loyalty and fidelity and that Moses only cared about whether he survived a battle. And I just, it's a great letter though. And it's a great letter because it forces people to read against the grain. Like why did this guy write this? And why didn't Moses take off? And it's a great discussion and people are like, well, wait a minute, if he ran off, well, what about his family back in Georgia, his black family, right? And if he ran off, where in God's name is he going to go? He doesn't have any money. And why is he so worried about his master or owner getting killed? Well, you want to be a black man in the Army of Northern Virginia with a bunch of white dudes with guns, and there is what? No protection for you? Now, I'm not saying that Moses and his, uh, the person who owned him, did not have an emotional relationship or bond. They might have, I don't know. But I do know this that taking that document, going out on that battlefield, talking about the enslaved experience. I, I go on Culp's Hill and I have people ready to read. This is my favorite part of the book. I don't like to sort of promote my book. I think that's kind of nonsense. I mean, I hope you all, if you are inclined, yeah, go out and read it, great. But one of my favorite parts of the book is the story of John Futch, F-U-T-C-H. I'll try one more time. John Futch, F-U-T-C-H. Third North Carolina. Evening of July 2nd, he's with his brother, Charlie. They're side by side. Charlie takes a bullet, hits him in the, in the head. Um, when he turned, blood was pouring down his face. His mouth was moving. No words were coming out. Just horrifying thought. Uh, John knew that, of course, that the wound was fatal. He, as John put it in his words, toted him off the field. Man, that is a real country term, toted. Yeah. He said, I yeah. toted him off the field. And what's all interesting about this, well, there are many things that are interesting. John Futch was illiterate, couldn't write, but he spoke his letters to comrades, comrades who could barely write themselves. Talking about an opening into the rawest, most visceral experience of the war, when John Futch, to comrades, opens up his heart because he wants his family back home to feel like they're at the side of his poor brother, Charlie, buried in Pennsylvania, knowing that he'll never see him again. And uh, I take that letter out there, have the folks read it, have my students read it. And then I say to them, is that a political letter? Because he's expressing that he wants to come home. Oh, no, no, he's just demoralized. He's physically ill. 
He's suffering trauma. He's mourning. You know what? All answers are correct. And Christian, I don't want you to get the wrong idea here or the people at home. I'm not one of those teachers that everybody is right. But yeah. in this instance, all those answers, it's all of the above. Now, a lot of people don't think it's political and I won't go too much longer on this anecdote, except to say this, that back in Virginia, John Futch and 11 other men, when Lee's army was having great revivals at the end of August, they got their muskets, their cartridge boxes, got extra ammunition, stuffed it in their pockets and deserted. Deserted, tried to get back down to North Carolina. Hmm. Did they make it? Got caught. And they got caught after a gun battle with a Confederate patrol. And it ended up in the largest execution in Lee's army. That story, Christian, is important. That story of the enslaved people is, is important. But those stories are the stories that are not heard because it is the reverberations of what happened on those hills at Gettysburg that can be felt all the way back down to North Carolina. And so I tell folks time and time again, do not treat any battlefield like a chessboard, rather see that battlefield in the ways that it connects those soldiers to their households, to their families. If you don't do that, you have, I think, a very impoverished view of military history. I agree, and, and you, you touched on a couple things about you know one of the things and I, I and I got we have questions so I want to get to them I just sure. want to make you know one of the things that you 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 touched on there that I've really experienced as I start working in the museum is um, you know when you go out with these tours you know you're engaging with you ask questions of the people you're giving the tour to you don't just talk to them and you know it's one of the things when you're at a historic site you know i've been in, like you i've been in i'm in the classroom nearly as much as you have but you know i've been in the classroom i've been at a historic site and the thing to always remember when you're at a historic site is that the people who are there really want to be there and so you know they'll engage with you way more often than your students will you know they want to to share their opinions with you you know if you ask them a hard question like some of the questions you're asking you'll get interesting answers back and i always try to remember that when i'm giving right. tours because because you can do that at a historic site i think more right. than in the classroom i think it's important to leave people with questions i don't think you need to give them all the answers i think yeah. you need to leave them feeling a little confused not confused yeah. because they don't know what's transpired at that site, but confused about their own thinking, that they need to be unsettled. There is, uh, I've done, I have, I've failed as an educator, I've failed as a public historian, if my students or my tour group, that they leave uh, having a sense of certitude about what we've just discussed. I, I am always, almost always about almost all things, always rethinking, reevaluating, because there's always a new source, a new book, the challenges, like the 1864 presidential election, I'll say it real quickly and then we can get to questions. Well, and I mean, somebody I, asked a question about that. Oh, so yeah, you touch on that, yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead, yeah. Do you wanna, do you wanna say the question? Um, well, they mostly wanted to know, you know, let me let me go back and make sure I get I do it justice. Um, they wanted to know how many union soldiers were going to furlough to vote in the 64 election? What was preference given to soldiers who were likely to vote for Lincoln, which that touches a little bit on John White's book, so yeah. Absolutely. Uh, well, I'm, unfortunately, I can't give any kind of numbers right. that I can say, and I'm, I'm glad this person asked this without question. Uh, Stanton and the War Department made certain that regiments that uh, were filled with Republican soldiers, that they got the opportunity to vote, including to be able to go home and to do so, and that there was, uh, you know, every effort made to often discriminate against uh, soldiers of Democratic leaning. And so, I know that how I've always understood this moment in reading people like James McPherson, that we have celebrated this election for taking place in the midst of a civil war. And that this is sort of a credit to our democracy. And please, I'm not a cynical dude. And I don't want to take away from the fact that it is pretty remarkable that Lincoln didn't just say, you know what, we're going to postpone this thing. But at the same time, we need to acknowledge that the 1864 election was far from a democratic one. And, you know, it is in fact an extension of, and that's probably not the right word, it's a reflection of how 19th century politics worked. Hell, mm -hmm. the, these elections, were, <laughs> they're not secret ballot, friends. It's not even close, man. You vote, you know, Democrat and your boss is Republican, they know it. God knows you could lose your job for it. And I think this just leads to a bigger point that we should all consider here is that we, 
today are so impatient with our democracy because we expect it to achieve a level of perfection that is truly unattainable. It is a democracy. You gotta remind yourself of that. It's rough and tumble, it's ugly. It's in the sewer kind of stuff. Now there are moments that we come out of that sewer and we get clean and they are beautiful moments. So I think a lot of the frustration that people have is well, one, their sense of history goes back maybe two weeks. And because it goes back and not very far, is that they really don't understand partisanship. They don't understand how they are very much supporting and benefiting from partisanship. I had a friend who said, oh, there's somebody, I think it was maybe down in Virginia, Southwest Virginia or Tennessee, who had some kind of bill or measure to get funding for a NASCAR track. And she said, well, I don't care at all about NASCAR. I was saying, that's, that's nothing but pork. I said, yeah, but what's pork to you is the very essence of their economy down there. Mm -hmm. And so I think that again, as a people, uh, I think uh, we had just to get a more realistic sense of what politics is about. And the 1864 presidential election is a nice reminder to us all. Democracies are never, never pure, rough and tumble, stuff, 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 stuff. Um. And we're, we're, we're getting close to time. So I'm going to ask you okay. one more question, but before I, one more history question, but before I do, we did get a question about the Civil War Institute. So when you're, when you're done answering this question, Pete, I would like to give you an opportunity to, to plug the Institute and talk about, you know, the future of the Institute. I know obviously COVID, but yeah, we can, we can get to that. So before I answer any of those questions, has anyone suggested a GoFundMe account to get my haircut? Has anyone said <laughs> that at all? There's no GoFundMe account for my haircut. That's what I was hoping for today. I like how many cost me a lot of money to get this there, cut. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, I had material on your hair, Pete, but I didn't have to use it. You were, you're, you know, yeah. yourself, so. <laughs> Um, we just got a question I think we need to ask about that because it's a it's an element that we haven't touched on yet, which is religion. Um, what role does religion play for these guys um, in all the stuff we've talked about? Yeah, I'm so glad that you've asked that because um, 19th century Americans, Northern and Southern, for the most part, understood their world as one in which providence had an active role in shaping human affairs as a way to reflect God's will, and that ultimately that, of course, God would reward his chosen people. To take the title of Christian's Advisor's book, Dr. <laughs> George Rabel writes a fantastic book. I just want to cut to the chase here is that, uh, as we all know, that the war did not follow a predictable script. In fact, what the war revealed, particularly on the battlefield, is that there didn't seem to be any plan at all. It was all chaos. And and so did soldiers in fact sort of recoil from this and renounce God or become faithless or start doubting the existence of God? And I didn't see much of that at all. I think that they did believe that God was distant. And that's a real test for any Christian, right? God feels distant, what do you do? Is this the time that you get on your knees and pray fervently and pray for some? example, some presence of God? Or do you simply just sit back and say, God is punishing us all, and we're going to have to, in one way or another, work through this horrific bloodletting to get to what his chosen outcome will be for us. Mm -hmm. And so faith, as one can imagine, provide these, provided these men with comfort, gave them a sense of uh, purpose. For some on the Confederate side, it turned them into zealots. But for many others, I think it left them puzzled, somewhat confused, maybe doubting from time to time, but ultimately understanding that God wasn't going to save them personally, that this was a great big crapshoot, and hopefully they'd get to the other side. Yeah. And now the Civil War Institute. Did we say something about that? Well, in, and before I say that, let me just, you know, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't, given who our guy is, the other person who's thinking about all those same things, by the way, is Abraham Lincoln. And, and you know, that's what the second inaugural really expresses. And that's a whole other program. So I won't get into it. But yeah, those exact, you know, everyone in the war is experiencing those same, you know, doubts. And, and but what is so that. beautiful about the second inaugural is that um, there is a lack of certitude on the part of Lincoln when it comes to God's presence in this war, except what? An acknowledgement of complicity on both sides. And there is a beauty and a power and a poignancy to that. 
Mm-hmm. That's a pretty massive political risk there, Mr. Lincoln. Absolutely. And, and except that he was absolutely right. And of course, I can't help but to be somewhat amused by the fact that in the onslaught against all things Confederate, that we have forgotten that this institution of slavery was not a Southern thing. It was a global thing and it was a Northern thing. And I'm not trying again to give anyone a free pass. It's in the past, I don't need to do that. But if we get self-righteous about slavery, it allows us to be self-righteous about capitalism. Because my friends, the tentacles of capitalism had a hold of slavery just like they have a hold of our lives. And that there are people across the globe right now who are suffering and paying a pretty high price for the world in which we live. And I say that not because I think I have any great answers to any of it. I absolutely do not. But I do know this. When people start getting again self-righteous about the past, it's a nice way to put on blinders about what's going on around you. All right, let's plug the Civil War Institute. Civil War <laughs> Institute, all right. There. Go for it. That. <laughs> Civil War Institute is second weekend of June. We have a little bit of a compressed schedule this year uh, because of COVID, but we are on and we already have 120 people signed up. Our speakers this year, Gary Gallagher is going to be there, which I'm thrilled about. Carol Reardon is going to come. Uh, Kit Masterson-Brown will be there. Jen Murray will be there. And what we do is this. We have tours during the day and we're gonna do them all close around Gettysburg. That's not what we typically do, but this is what COVID is forcing us to do. So we have battlefield tours. We have a lot of guides who will take us along the route of a regiment, see what they did during the battle, and then go behind the lines and go to their field hospital. So we're gonna go to the barn where Barksdale's brigade was as well. So you get a lot of up close and personal with attendees of all backgrounds and all interests. You do not have to be a zealot about the Civil War to come to the Institute and also know that our topics come from all angles. Politics, Lincoln, home front, military, you name it, we do it. Christian, you're one of my first speakers that came. I think, in fact, you were on the first uh, lineup that I ever ever did. I have to get you to come I, back. Really? Out. I, you know I, I, yeah, you I came you, up there and talked about music. So yeah, that's every angle, about right? music. We need you to come out and talk about your place, talk about the Lincoln Museum. And I need to get back out there. I haven't been to your site. I've not seen the new museum. It's been it's been more than 15 years since I've been to Springfield. Well, that's about when it started. So yeah. yeah. It's, been, it's been 15 years, I think, as well. Well, so I'd love to give you a tour love, and I love being in Gettysburg. So yeah, it's, it, it's great. If anyone has to do just do Civil War Institute, Gettysburg, you'll see it. And if you can't just, you got my name, just Google my name, Gettysburg College, send me an email. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Well, all right. Well, I want to thank you, Pete. This is, uh, you didn't disappoint, Pete. This is uh, what, exactly what I wanted. You did a great job, gave us lots to think about. So yeah, thanks so much for coming on. And uh, I'd love to have you on again, because I think there's so much stuff we could talk you know, about. Well, man, so you may get another call. Absolutely, in any time. And you know, I just, again, want to thank your audience for uh, taking some of their evening uh, to spend with us. And Christian, yeah. again, congratulations. Uh, on a very successful career. A man, again, a public historian who's published a book is a difficult thing to do. And uh, very excited to get out to Springfield and uh, and to see all the great work that you all are going to be doing with Erin. It's going to be very exciting. She's fantastic. You guys are very, very fortunate to have her. Very fortunate. Oh, and there she is still. There she is. Yep, I was going to say thanks again, Pete. And um, you definitely have to come out then. I didn't realize that you hadn't even seen it yet. So. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I'll bring my mom. If I bring my mom, though, I'm going to have to get my hair cut. She won't be seen with me in public about it. So. Fair. <laughs> That's right. We got that matching hair. There we go. All right. Thank you well, again, as, all. I really do appreciate it. As we wrap up again, Pete and Christian, thank you so much for taking your time um, to share your passion, your clear passion, and your insights about everything tonight. You really helped to make everything come alive for everyone in the audience. Um, Like we said, if we'd like to encourage everyone out there to go purchase the book, The War on the Common Soldier, if you haven't already, we will include it in a link in the follow-up email as well. Um, Tonight's presentation is being recorded. We'll share it on our Facebook and our YouTube pages within the next 24 hours. We encourage you to share this with others in your life. Um, This encourages them to become a member of the foundation and they can receive these same benefits. So as always, we also want to make sure that you're aware of the upcoming webinars that we have coming up for our members. January 26th in two weeks, we have David Wiegers. He's going to join us and share his passion and talents of the photography 
photography of Lincoln statues. He has a great visual presentation. He's really been all around the world studying these statues. So this should be interesting. Um, and February is a unique month for us because we actually have three offerings. One, including Erin Carlson Mast, um, our new CEO and president. We're gonna spend the whole hour talking to her about her experiences and her um, future vision for us at the foundation and the library museum collaboration. Um, after her, we have Justin Blanford talking about the old state capital. And then after him, we have um, Dr. Favolia Glimpf. I'm probably saying that. Mm -hmm. no, okay. You got, um, <laughs> you got it right, Favolia Glimpf. Yeah. Well, wonderful, going. wonderful. Um, about her yeah. recent book on women's suffrage. So this is gonna be fantastic. Um, and as we close out the webinar tonight, we do have a short survey. We ask everyone to take it, helps us to improve our offerings. It also lets us know what you wanna see in the future. So as always, if you're willing, um, please make a contribution to the foundation, www.aoplm.org. And we thank everybody for joining tonight and we wish you well, and we'll see you soon. And thanks again, Pete. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, y'all.